filmmaker Toral Cove. How does it feel to have your short film, Me and My Molten, at TIFF 2014? It is very exciting. It, it's just, I've never been here at TIFF before, and uh, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. And you, this story is based on you and your family. So growing up, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about your home and were you as embarrassed as the character was, you know, about your, I think, what was a really cool upbringing with your parents being uh, like modern architects? Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the reasons that this is now a film mm -hmm. and the story that I decided to write was because as I grew older, I realized that my parents were incredibly hip. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they were so cool. Yeah. And, uh, great parents uh, but I think when I was little I felt not so much like that I felt that they were really I really did wish that they were more like other parents and it wasn't really that they were that different I think it was just that they had this they were very um, concerned with projecting something uh, that was uh, modern and uh, something that had broken with the past and something that was kind of uniquely them. Mm -hmm. I don't. I think it was partly because they were modernist architects, you know, in the 50s, early 60s. But I think it. I think it was probably other reasons too. Mm -hmm. I think they probably carried with them some kind of baggage from their families that made them feel like, you know, we want to create something that's completely different. Um, and uh, they didn't ask us, you know, <laughs> about that, of course. So it was just, I, I think really it was a, l a lot of little things, but uh, over the years what I focused on was this business with the dresses, um, mm -hmm. that uh, all our dresses were these, you know, had nothing to do with what was desirable at the time for a seven, eight year old. Which we have right behind us. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, now I wish I had all these dresses. And in fact, I've spent you know, a reasonable amount of money recently buying two dresses like that from Mary Mecco. So that <laughs> I could have something similar for, you know, this is kind of a nostalgic uh, thing. Um, and like, it's interesting that, you know, your, your parents imported this special fabric and made these beautiful dresses that you thought yeah. looked like something out of the museum. But yeah. can you speak a little bit to kids? I mean, I think everywhere just wanting to like have the, the average kid stuff, whatever everyone else is having. No, and I mean, if you look at, if you look at, I mean, if you stand and start outside the schoolyard now and look in, they're all wearing the same, yeah. you know, <laughs> they're all wearing the same clothes. And every now and then you, you'll see somebody who who sticks out but basically I think it's like a you know like it comes some kind of a mob group mentality that for kids that you just there's security in fitting in mm -hmm. you know then you don't have to explain yourself mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's not like we got teased about it or anything like that but uh, I think there was uh, there was a longing for uh, for being more conventional and my parents weren't that yeah. and what struck me in the film was how polite you were as children you know even you know with the molten you never you weren't mean to your parents or you weren't mm. yeah so tell me a little bit about that relationship because it was so sweet and so respectful I think I might have had more attitude when I was younger <laughs> yeah we didn't uh, we and but you know what we were like that with all these things and I, I shouldn't project what my sisters were doing but I always I felt very protective of my parents, and, I, and I'm really interested in this uh, from a sort of psychological point of view, this care that some kids will take in protecting their parents from disappointment. Um, I mean, I see it in my own daughter now that, that she knows when I expect her to react a certain way with a certain amount of gratitude and stuff like that, you know? So it's, um, I, just find, I just find that fascinating how that there's a kind of a power uh, imbalance between people who give and people who receive. I think it's a very delicate kind of dance that people do. Mm -hmm. the, the giver is the generous one and the receiver is always the grateful one. And somehow mm -hmm. these, you know, you have to meet. And I think that if you deep down don't feel grateful or happy about the gift that you have received, it's kind of your job to fake it. You know, I mean, we've all been there, haven't yeah, we? Absolutely. Yeah, we have. And I think kids. Thank you. <laughs> I think kids know that. And you do this to not hurt the other person's feeling, you know? Absolutely. And I really felt that with my parents. I think deep inside, I had this awareness that they were trying so hard <laughs> to, to be, you know, the best that they could be. And uh, I was not going to let them down. You know? And at what point in your life did you transition from, you know, wanting what all the other kids have to seeing them as like 
because they are super cool. Yeah. So at what point did you see them as hip as they are? I don't know, a few years ago. <laughs> 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 you know, fairly recently. I, I think maybe when, I don't, I don't know, I think probably when I was in my 30s, I think. I think it took a while, you mm -hmm. know? Absolutely. Yeah. And there's also a sideline with uh, your neighbors mm -hmm. as well. Uh, tell me a little bit about striking the balance between, you know, having this film based on your own life and then also fictionalizing aspects of it. And as a filmmaker, how, you know, that can be challenging at times. That was, uh, in fact, with this story, it was really challenging because I had thought I wanted to be as true as possible with my family, what happens in the upstairs in this building, in this house. I, I, I kind of felt like I needed the downstairs as a kind of a, a contrast to uh, illustrate what I wanted to illustrate. But um, but uh, what it, what actually happened in that family was very I mean it was very tragic. The father actually died. He mm -hmm. died and he could not have been more than I mean he must have been in his earlier mid thirties or something like that. And it made a it made a huge impact on me and it made an impact on my friendship with my my uh, the, the girl who was my best friend because there was like it was like she had experienced something that was just kind of way beyond anything that I could understand, mm -hmm. you know? And it is very much like I say in the film, I just didn't know what to do. And I thought that was an important part of the story. But at the same time, I didn't feel really that I could make a film that's only about 14 minutes long and have the death of a father be a part of the story that wasn't even my story. Mm -hmm. So I had two versions of this film flipping back and forth. In one, he dies, like in reality, and then the other one, he, he leaves. And in the end, I decided that it was more respectful of this family to, to that he leaves, because then I felt more justified in saying, look, this is a part of the story that I'm fictionalizing. This isn't actually true. If I had had him die, I would have felt that I was using somebody else's um, family tragedy for for something that wasn't really, you know, my story, it's their story. But in the end, I also felt bad about rewriting this because a divorce is so different from a death. Mm -hmm. I mean, a divorce is horrible mm -hmm. for everybody involved, but it's very different from a death. It's a very different kind of loss. And um, in the end, I um, decided to do the version where he just leaves. And uh, but I felt that I had to tell my friend about it, which I did. Mm -hmm. And um, she admitted that it was a difficult thing to see, but uh, I think she she understood the uh, you know the dilemma and the context and everything. But it was I think it was a very interesting experience as a writer, filmmaker, someone who makes up stories that are built on some true things because at some point I was worried you know am I doing something illegal here and I consulted even consulted lawyers about this mm -hmm. and they all said no this isn't illegal you're not using anybody's names uh, the place is fairly neutral it could be anywhere really mm -hmm. and uh, so they said you know don't worry about it and you don't have to ask her or tell her but I always felt like there was an ethical issue here and yeah. I I hated the idea of this family uh, you know, just coming across this in the media or on TV and just s thinking, well, that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't leave, he died. Absolutely. That's horrible. That's very, very good of you to, do, to take well, those steps. No, I mean, as some parts of me feel, you know, I feel bad about it, not maybe earlier on having just rewritten the whole thing or made it more anonymous, you know, less autobiographical, but I think at the point where this started really preoccupying me, we were so far into the production that I, I you know, I was a bit stuck. Okay. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about working with the National Film Board and, you know, how the film really came together. Well, uh, I've, I've, I mean, the film board, I don't know, I mean, I, I can't really say enough good things about the film <laughs> board. I love, I love it there. I love the institution and I love my colleagues. They're great, you know, it's a great place to work and really, it's wonderful. Great. I know everybody says this, but it's really true. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the best place for us to find out more information on you and the film and your other work as well online? Uh, well, you can find it on um, on uh, the NFB website, but before I'm done with raving about the NFB, 
B, I also want to rave about the studio that I work with in Norway, who, who is the co-producer, and they're called Microfilm, and it's an independent animation studio in Oslo that does wonderful things. And uh, I have worked with them. This is my second film with them now. And, and I think for me, this combination of the National Film Board and Microfilm, I just feel you know, it's just the best place to be. It's wonderful, yeah. And I have to ask you, do you ride a bicycle or a molten? What's your, what's your ride of preference today? I don't ride bikes. I, I think they're too dangerous. <laughs> I, I bought a bike a few years ago and I think I used it once. I live in Montreal and I, you know, biked around the streets there and I was just like a nervous wreck at the end of the day. Yeah. And I thought, this is it. I'm walking or taking the bus, you know, no biking for me. I bike in Norway. They have a better bike path system, okay. but not here. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Congratulations. The film is wonderful and have a great tiff. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Katie Allman reporting for Katie Chats at the National Film Board in downtown Toronto.